Recording by Colleen McMahon. Bone to His Bone by E. G. Swain. William Whitehead, Fellow of Emmanuel College in the University of Cambridge, became Vicar of Stoneground in the year 1731. The annals of his incumbency were doubtless short and simple. They have not survived. In his day were no newspapers to collect gossip, no parish magazines to record the simple events of parochial life. One event, however, of greater moment then than now, is recorded in two places. Vicar Whitehead failed in health after 23 years of work and journeyed to Bath in what his monument calls the vain hope of being restored. The duration of his visit is unknown. It is reasonable to suppose that he made his journey in the summer. It is certain that by the month of November, his physician told him to lay aside all hope of recovery. Then it was that the thoughts of the patient turned to the comfortable, straggling vicarage he had left at Stoneground, in which he had hoped to end his days. He prayed that his successor might be as happy there as he had been himself, setting his affairs in order, as became one who had but a short time to live, he executed a will, bequeathing to the vicars of Stoneground forever the close of ground he had recently purchased, because it lay next to the vicarage garden. And by a codicil he added to the bequest his library of books. Within a few days, William Whitehead was gathered to his father's. A mural tablet in the north aisle of the church records in Latin his services and his bequests, his two marriages, and his fruitless journey to Bath. The house he loved but never again saw was taken down forty years later and rebuilt by Vicar James Devy. The garden, with Vicar Whitehead's close of ground and other adjacent lands, was opened out and planted somewhat before 1850 by Vicar Robert Towerson. The aspect of everything has changed, but in a convenient chamber on the first floor of the present vicarage, the library of Vicar Whitehead stands very much as he used it and loved it, and as he bequeathed it to his successors forever. The books there are arranged as he arranged and ticketed them. Little slips of paper, sometimes bearing interesting fragments of writing, still mark his places. His marginal comments still give life to pages from which all other interest has faded, and he would have but a dull imagination who could sit in the chamber amidst these books without ever being carried back 180 years into the past to the time when the newest of them left the printer's hands. Of those into whose possession the books have come, some have doubtless loved them more and some less. Some, perhaps, have left them severely alone. But neither those who loved them nor those who loved them not have lost them, and they passed, some century and a half after William Whitehead's death, into the hands of Mr. Batchel, who loved them as a father loves his children. He lived alone and had few domestic cares to distract his mind. He was able, therefore, to enjoy to the full what Vicar Whitehead had enjoyed so long before him. During many a long summer evening would he sit, poring over long-forgotten books, and since the chamber, otherwise called the library, faced the south, he could also spend sunny winter mornings there without discomfort. Writing at a small table, or reading as he stood at a tall desk, he would browse amongst the books like an ox in a pleasant pasture. There were other times also at which Mr. Batchel would use the books. Not being a sound sleeper, for book-loving men seldom are, he elected to use as a bedroom one of the two chambers which opened at either side into the library. The arrangement enabled him to beguile many a sleepless hour amongst the books, and in view of these nocturnal visits he kept a candle standing in a sconce above the desk and matches always ready to his hand. There was one disadvantage in this close proximity of his bed to the library. Owing, apparently, to some defect in the fittings of the room, which, having no mechanical taste, Mr. Batchel had never investigated, there could be heard in the stillness of the night exactly such sounds as might arise from a person moving about amongst the books. Visitors using the other adjacent room would often remark at breakfast that they had heard their host in the library at one or two o'clock in the morning when in fact he had not left his bed. Invariably, Mr. Batchel allowed them to suppose that he had been where they had thought him. He disliked idle controversy and was unwilling to afford an opening for supernatural talk. Knowing well enough the sounds by which his guests had been deceived, he wanted no other explanation of them than his own, though it was of too vague a character to count as an explanation. 
He conjectured that the window sashes or the doors or something were defective and was too phlegmatic and too unpractical to make any investigation. The matter gave him no concern. Persons whose sleep is uncertain are apt to have their worst nights when they would like their best. The consciousness of a special need for rest seems to bring enough mental disturbance to forbid it. So on Christmas Eve in the year 1907, Mr. Batchel, who would have liked to sleep well in view of the labors of Christmas Day, lay hopelessly wide awake. He exhausted all of the known devices for courting sleep, and at the end found himself wider awake than ever. A brilliant moon shone into his room, for he hated window blinds. There was a light wind blowing, and the sounds in the library were more than usually suggestive of a person moving about. He almost determined to have the sashes seen to, although he could seldom be induced to have anything seen to. He disliked changes even for the better, and would submit to great inconvenience rather than have things altered with which he had become familiar. As he revolved these matters in his mind, he heard the clocks strike the hour of midnight, and having now lost all hope of falling asleep, he rose from his bed, got into a large dressing gown which hung in readiness for such occasions, and passed into the library, with the intention of reading himself sleepy if he could. The moon by this time had passed out of the south, and the library seemed all the darker by contrast with the moonlit chamber he had left. He could see nothing but two blue-gray rectangles formed by the windows against the sky, the furniture of the room being altogether invisible. Groping along to where the table stood, Mr. Batchel felt over its surface for the matches which usually lay there. He found, however, that the table was cleared of everything. He raised his right hand, therefore, in order to feel his way to a shelf where the matches were sometimes mislaid, and at that moment, whilst his hand was in mid-air, the matchbox was gently put into it. Such an incident could hardly fail to disturb even a phlegmatic person, and Mr. Batchel cried, Who's this? somewhat nervously. There was no answer. He struck a match, looked hastily round the room, and found it empty as usual. There was everything, that is to say, that he was accustomed to see, but no other person than himself. It is not quite accurate, however, to say that everything was in its usual state, Upon the tall desk lay a quarto volume that he had certainly not placed there. It was his quite invariable practice to replace his books upon the shelves after using them, and what we may call his library habits were precise and methodical. A book out of place like this was not only an offense against good order, but a sign that his privacy had been intruded upon. With some surprise, therefore, he lit the candle standing ready in the sconce and proceeded to examine the book, not sorry, in the disturbed condition in which he was, to have an occupation found for him. The book proved to be one with which he was unfamiliar, and this made it certain that some other hand than his had removed it from its place. Its title was The Complete Gardener of Monsieur de la Quintinay, made English by John Evelyn Esquire. It was not a work in which Mr. Batchel felt any great interest. It consisted of diverse reflections on various parts of husbandry, doubtless entertaining enough, but too deliberate and discursive for practical purposes. He had certainly never used the book, and growing restless now in mind, said to himself that some boy having the freedom of the house had taken it down from its place in the hope of finding pictures. But even whilst he made this explanation, he felt its weakness. To begin with, the desk was too high for a boy. The improbability that any boy would place a book there was equaled by the improbability that he would leave it there. To discover its uninviting character would be the work only of a moment, and no boy would have brought it so far from its shelf. Mr. Batchel, however, had come to read, and habit was too strong with him to be wholly set aside. Leaving the complete gardener on the desk, he turned round to the shelves to find some more congenial reading. Hardly had he done this when he was startled by a sharp rap upon the desk behind him, followed by a rustling of paper. He turned quickly about and saw the quarto lying open. In obedience to the instinct of the moment, he at once sought a natural cause for what he saw. Only a wind, and that of the strongest, could have opened the book and laid back its heavy cover, and though he accepted for a brief moment that explanation, he was too candid to retain it longer. The wind out of doors was very light. The window sash was closed and latched, and to decide the matters finally, 
The book had its back and not its edges turned towards the only quarter from which a wind could strike. Mr. Batchel approached the desk again and stood over the book. With increasing perturbation of mind, for he still thought of the matchbox, he looked upon the open page. Without much reason beyond that he felt constrained to do something, he read the words of the half-completed sentence at the turn of the page. At dead of night he left the house and passed into the solitude of the garden. But he read no more, nor did he give himself the trouble of discovering whose midnight wanderings were being described although the habit was singularly like one of his own. He was in no condition for reading, and turning his back upon the volume, he slowly paced the length of the chamber, wondering at that which had come to pass. He reached the opposite end of the chamber, and was in the act of turning when he again heard the rustling of paper, and by the time he had faced round, saw the leaves of the book again turning over. In a moment, the volume lay at rest, open in another place, and there was no further movement as he approached it. To make sure that he had not been deceived, he read again the words as they entered the page. The author was following a not uncommon practice of the time, and throwing common speech into forms suggested by holy writ. So dig, it said, that ye may obtain. This passage, which to Mr. Batchel seemed reprehensible in its levity, excited at once his interest and his disapproval. He was prepared to read more, but this time was not allowed. Before his eye could pass beyond the passage already cited, the leaves of the book slowly turned again and presented but a termination of five words and a colophon. The words were, To the North and Ilex. These three passages, in which he saw no meaning and no connection, began to entangle themselves together in Mr. Batchel's mind. He found himself repeating them in different orders, now beginning with one and now with another. Any further attempt at reading he felt to be impossible and he was in no mind for any more experiences of the unaccountable. Sleep was, of course, further from him than ever, if that were conceivable. What he did, therefore, was to blow out the candle to return to his moonlit bedroom, and put on more clothing, and then to pass downstairs with the object of going out of doors. It was not unusual with Mr. Batchel to walk about his garden at night time. This form of exercise had often, after a wakeful hour, sent him back to his bed refreshed and ready for sleep. The convenient access to the garden at such times lay through his study, whose French windows opened onto a short flight of steps, and upon these he now paused for a moment to admire the snow-like appearance of the lawns, bathed as they were in the moonlight. As he paused, he heard the city clocks strike the half-hour after midnight, and he could not forbear repeating aloud, at dead of night he left the house and passed into the solitude of the garden. It was solitary enough. At intervals the screech of an owl, and now and then the noise of a train, seemed to emphasize the solitude by drawing attention to it and then leaving it in possession of the night. Mr. Batchel found himself wondering and conjecturing what Vicar Whitehead, who had acquired the close of land to secure quiet and privacy for garden, would have thought of the railways to the west and the north. He turned his face northwards, whence a whistle had just sounded, and saw a tree beautifully outlined against the sky. His breath caught at the sight, not because the tree was unfamiliar. Mr. Batchel knew all his trees, but what he had seen was, to the north, an ilex. Mr. Batchel knew not what to make of it all. He had walked into the garden hundreds of times, and as often had seen the ilex, but the words out of the complete gardener seemed to be pursuing him in a way that made him almost afraid. His temperament, however, as has been said already, was phlegmatic. It was commonly said, and Mr. Batchel approved the verdict, while he condemned its inexactness, that his nerves were made of fiddle string. So he braced himself afresh and set upon his walk round the silent garden, which he was accustomed to begin in a northerly direction, and was now too proud to change. He usually passed the ilex at the beginning of his perambulation, and so would pass it now. He did not pass it. A small discovery as he reached it annoyed and disturbed him. His gardener, as careful and punctilious as himself, never failed to house all his tools at the end of a day's work. Yet there, under the ilex, standing upright in moonlight brilliant enough to cast a shadow of it, was a spade. Mr. Batchel's second thought was one of relief. After his extraordinary experiences in the library, 
He hardly knew now whether they had been real or not. Something quite commonplace would act sedatively, and he determined to carry the spade to the tool house. The soil was quite dry, and the surface even a little frozen, so Mr. Batchel left the path, walked up to the spade, and would have drawn it toward him. But it was as if he had made the attempt upon the trunk of the ilex itself. The spade would not be moved. Then, first with one hand, and then with both, he tried to raise it, and still it stood firm. Mr. Batchel, of course, attributed this to the frost, slight as it was. Wondering at the spade's being there, and annoyed at its being frozen, he was about to leave it and continue his walk, when the remaining words of the complete gardener seemed rather to utter themselves than to await his will. So dig that ye may obtain. Mr. Batchel's power of independent action now deserted him. He took the spade, which no longer resisted, and began to dig. Five spadefuls and no more, he said aloud. This is all foolishness. Four spadefuls of earth he then raised and spread out before him in the moonlight. There was nothing unusual to be seen. Nor did Mr. Batchel decide what he would look for, whether coins, jewels, documents and canisters, or weapons. In point of fact, he dug against what he deemed his better judgment, and expected nothing. He spread before him the fifth and last spadeful of earth, not quite without result, but with no result that was at all sensational. The earth contained a bone. Mr. Batchel's knowledge of anatomy was sufficient to show him that it was a human bone. He identified it, even by moonlight, as the radius, a bone of the forearm, as he removed the earth from it with his thumb. Such a discovery might be thought worthy of more than the very ordinary interest Mr. Batchel showed. As a matter of fact, the presence of a human bone was easily to be accounted for. Recent excavations within the church had caused the upturning of numberless bones, which had been collected and reverently buried. But an earth-stained bone is also easily overlooked, and this radius had obviously found its way into the garden with some of the earth brought out of the church. Mr. Batchel was glad, rather than regretful, at this termination to his adventure. He was once more provided with something to do. The reinterment of such bones as this had been his constant care, and he decided at once to restore the bone to consecrated earth. The time seemed opportune. The eyes of the curious were closed in sleep. He himself was still alert and wakeful. The spade remained by his side and the bone in his hand. So he betook himself, there and then, to the churchyard. By the still generous light of the moon, he found a place where the earth yielded to his spade, and within a few minutes the bone was laid decently to earth some eighteen inches deep. The city clocks struck one as he finished. The whole world seemed asleep, and Mr. Batchel slowly returned to the garden with his spade. As he hung it in its accustomed place, he felt stealing over him the welcome desire to sleep. He walked quietly on to the house and ascended to his room. It was now dark. The moon had passed on and left the room in shadow. He lit a candle, and before undressing, passed into the library. He had an irresistible curiosity to see the passages in John Evelyn's book, which had so strangely adapted themselves to the events of the past hour. In the library, a last surprise awaited him. The desk upon which the book had lain was empty. The complete gardener stood in its place on the shelf. And then Mr. Batchel knew that he had handled a bone of William Whitehead, and that in response to his own entreaty. End of Bone to His Bone Recording by Colleen McMahon